Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soul, and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I get to talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go around is Melissa Fortunato. So how did this shy, anxious kid grow up to be an FBI hostage negotiator? Uh, honestly, it was by saying yes to things. She has had quite an interesting journey from working in a crisis center to FBI undercover work, then hostage negotiator, and now she uses those honed skills to help folks from all walks of life to communicate and negotiate more empathetically. She's a pretty awesome human and one you should definitely uh, meet if you get the chance. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Melissa. Melissa, thank you for joining me on the Why Am I podcast. Hi, Greg. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, a little while in the making. So um, my scenario for today, I kind of go in and out of this. Sometimes I do scenarios, sometimes I don't. I'm feeling a scenario today. Uh, I'm thinking uh, I'm outside of uh, the the food court probably at uh, some conference and I see you wearing a speaker badge, and uh, you know I just start up a, a conversation as I want to do, and uh, you know we kindly you you ask me about me first, and I exhaust that quickly because I am a super boring dude, legit. I there's not a whole lot going on here, uh, <laughs> but it's your turn to reciprocate. So Melissa, who are you? Well, Greg, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming up to me in this imaginary <laughs> food court at some imaginary <laughs> conference. Um, I would appreciate as a speaker if you would do that, because sometimes if you're a speaker, you might not know a lot of people and you could just be wandering around by yourself. So uh, do you feel a little self-conscious in those scenarios? Um, sometimes it's nice to just go off on your own to get your mind right if you are giving a speech. But it's always nice if someone, you know, approaches you because every conversation is fascinating. So I welcome them. Um, but I will it would explain to you that my name is Melissa Fortunato. Um I am a retired FBI agent. I spent 23 years in the FBI and uh, retired last year. And I am now in the negotiation, training, and consulting space. So I meet with people. I talk to them a lot about the power of communication and conflict resolution and helping people learn some skills around that based on my prior experience. Um, I'm also a mother of two teenage girls and a wife, so I use my crisis negotiation skills on a daily basis. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can, I can see that coming in. Although, do you? <laughs> I was thinking about this because you know, obviously, going in, I knew you had done some uh, negotiation work and stuff like that. And uh, the fact that you have teenagers, do you? Uh, do you start in kind of your negotiation voice and then your teenagers are immediately like, stop doing that, mom? You're like, you're like, do they do they sense it or has it just become part of you? No, they totally sense it now. I consider that a compliment that maybe they're becoming <laughs> more sophisticated and they're able to see those things um, and they recognize it at least. So maybe that's just part of the process. But yes, they will often make fun of me by saying, okay, Miss Negotiator, you know, so that's a good <laughs> thing. Yeah. Well, you said wife too. Do you do you feel like you use that in your personal relationship a lot, kind of with your partner? All the time. Yeah. And I think that's the best thing about, like people think because I was in the FBI and I was a hostage negotiator for years, that it's like a separate skill that I did when I went to work, right? Or there's some magic trick or technique that I learned. And And yes, you do learn to be a better listener and communicator, but in every area of my life, I use all the skills and I've taken skills I've learned in my personal life, what worked and didn't work, and I use it in my work life, right? So they overlap in all of your worlds. And I just think I've seen the power of communication and really listening to people. And I wish people would focus on it more and try it more in all areas of their life because I think it's super impactful. That's interesting. Oh, I mean, you know, a lot of people you talk to, you know, there's this common theme of like, don't bring your home or rather don't bring your work home with you. You know, you're supposed to keep that over there, kind of keep your world separate. But it sounds like you're all, I mean, you're encouraging to, to sort of blur those lines a bit. Yeah. Now, in fairness, my husband is also a retired FBI agent. So we blurred those lines every minute of every day between <laughs> our logistics and just processing life. Yeah, fair um, enough. But yes, I think it is definitely a skill, you know, that you can use in all areas. It's not like I'm an accountant or something. So. 
But even those, I guess you would use in your financial life. But yeah. Well, I mean, you weren't, you obviously, you weren't always uh, like an FBI agent. So who are you, who are you before this? Like, cause I'm curious, like I, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. And, and I, I'm assuming it's, it's a big part of your identity and who you identify yourself as now. But who are you, who are you before you were Melissa, the FBI agent? That's a great question. Um, so like stat wise, I mean, I grew up in Philadelphia. I'm the youngest of three daughters. I have wonderful, loving parents. All of those things have developed me into the person that I am. Um, I have a background in psychology. Hmm. So I think even as a kid, I was fascinated by people and watching people, really fascinated by why people do bad things. I don't hmm. know why. There was always a part of me that just thought that was so interesting and cool. And I went to school for psychology and I thought I would become a counselor, go on and become a psychologist. At that time, I imagined myself being a psychologist, having my own practice and seeing clients. Life is funny and you really never know where it's going to go and it takes a lot of twists and turns, right? And so I just had found myself in my prior life, I worked as a sexual assault crisis counselor. Oof. And I loved every minute of it. Um, wow. Cause you could really get in with people at a time that they needed it. And you could do great work because it was people coming to you at a challenging time that needed help. And so they were invested in trying to get better. And I loved everything about it, but just a different conversation with someone led me to even think about the FBI. It huh. never was on my radar screen ever. I don't know any, didn't know any FBI agents. I didn't know anyone in law enforcement, really. In my life at the crisis center, I worked with police officers and the court systems with the victims. So it gave me a little glimpse into that world. And I loved it. I love sort of the grittiness of it. Um, I love the dark side of it. Not sure what that says about me, but it probably does say something. And it just started from there. And somebody gave me an application because it was actually a girl that I worked with. She said her whole life she wanted to be an FBI agent. And I had never known anyone that would consider that. And at the time I said to her, like, how do you even do that? Like, and she was saying, I don't know. Hmm. And someone brought back applications to us and gave her one to actually give her to pursue her dream and gave me one kind of as a ha ha, you ask a lot of questions about how to do it. Here's how you do it. Strangely enough, she didn't go on to be an FBI agent, and I did, hmm. which is such a weird turn, I think. Um, but it just started with me talking to people saying, do you think I could do this? And I had some supportive, wonderful people in my life that were like, go for it. And I just kept saying yes to the next step. It was such a big goal that I didn't have prior. So to me, it's great to be young and fearless, right? <laughs> um, I just said, I'll try it. And I was perfectly fine if they told me no, because I loved what I was doing. And it wasn't this dream that I had all this invested in. I just was like taking a shot. And they said yes. And they kept saying yes. Mm -hmm. Here I am 24 years later retired. So I guess it worked out. That's interesting. So there's a, there's so much going on there. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of parallels kind of in my life, just seeing yeah. uh, these big daunting tasks. I mean, what's the old saying? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And yes, uh, I very much like this big daunting thing that was coming up. I kept telling myself, uh, it's not going to happen, but I'll just do this next little step. And then I would complete that step and I'd say, but don't worry about it because it's not going to happen. And then I would complete the next step. And then before you knew it, I was, you know, I was in the, I was right in the frying pan and yeah, uh, survived it. But love that. that that really fascinates me is you're talking about why do uh, people do bad things? So I, I've noticed like in myself too, like when I was a kid, like crime really fascinated me because I, th I feel like it was, mm, it was sort of like this thing I wasn't supposed to be interested in or that I <laughs> wasn't supposed to see, you know? And, and yep. so it just kind of, it like it had this allure of like, oh, there's this thing I'm not supposed to know about. It's like this forbidden information. Yeah. Is that is that sort of what it was for you a little bit? Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I, do, I haven't, and I should, I haven't analyzed why I think that. 
I will say there's probably all of us, um, my kids joke and they call it like intrusive thoughts, right? I think we all have these weird random thoughts. And so there's, the humans are fascinating, right? And we have all sides. We have our wonderful good sides and we all have that bad side, right? And it really is a conscious choice every day. Some people less conscious or more conscious. Um, but I, I think that's what's fascinating to me, the human element of it is that we all have it and it's a series of relationships that you have and choices that you make and people that surround yourself with that can lead you in different directions. And I notice it even in my life in the FBI, you would be across from somebody that I have arrested or prosecuting and you could really like them. And it's just sometimes a series of small choices that you maybe weren't as aware of, like not looking it all the way down. And you ended up in a place over here that has you sitting, you know, with your name after the United States verse, whatever. And I just, I, I just love that. I think, you know, it could be a me. It just was, I had wonderful parents and I made good choices and I had options and opportunities and, um, I wasn't abused and all these things that could mm. lead you in different directions. Right. And I, that human part, I love, I mean, I'm still like, my kids laugh. I still listen to true crime series shows and all of it because the humanness of it is what really draws me in. Yeah. I know it's, a, for me, it's been a fascinating journey of, of my life. So I used to, I used to look at people in prison, like prisoners, criminals, right? Like they, to me, that's what they were. They were just people who did bad yeah. stuff. But then there's this realization that, you know, you don't take normal people just, you know, just living their happy go lucky life and then one day they decide to start doing crime. It's you know, it's like you yep. said, it's it's a process. It's one thing that leads to another. And I actually found this podcast called Ear Hustle. That's um if you're not familiar with it, it's recorded in San Quentin prison out in California by the prisoners themselves. Oh and wow. It's this fascinating look into all of these people. And they not every episode is like heavy. Most of them are actually pretty funny. Um which is crazy because all of a sudden they started being humans and now like people in prison, I don't refer to them as like criminals or whatever. I refer to them as incarcerated people, right? Yeah. And you hear <laughs> some of the stories of, of how these folks got there and they come from the most broken homes, the worst scenarios. And what's crazy is some of these, some of these cats in there, they like, they won't, they won't blame that. They won't blame the incredible abuse they suffered for why they did the corrupt. They won't even give it any yeah uh, any any space they only blame themselves it's like this was me this was my decision and so I, it's tough to hear that right like because you want to see these people as bad horrible people but you realize that they were slowly over time created in this fashion and and there weren't a lot of options for them it's really tough and so it, it sounds like you're fascinated by the process like how does one get here it's like almost uh, sherlock holmes right we have we have yeah. the results, but what's everything that led up to this? And and that truly fascinates me about people as well. Yeah. And I think I love that you do that, Greg, is that you do look at it that way, because I think it's so simple and easy to just say they're prisoners. So they're over here and I'm over here. And I do think my life as a hostage negotiator, what makes, you know, made me more successful was the ability to not put myself so separate from someone else. Hmm. I... I really tried hard to see, oh, I, I could maybe end up where you ended up mm. if you had this or you made that choice or I made mm. a different. And you can still say, I would not have chose to do what you did in that moment, whatever the crime was, but I can see how you got there. And I think it's that empathy, that ability to put yourself in the perspective of someone else, I do think is where the connection can really come in. And that's where I think you can get people to really listen to you and be your most effective in any job, even if it's, you know, you work in an office and you don't like somebody on your team, but you're just trying to understand where they come from. Or maybe you're a boss and you have a difficult employee. And if you can try to understand how they got there and, and you seek out that information, it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. I think it really can be like a behavioral changing experience. Man, you got to get out of my brain. That's like, <laughs> this, those are, those are some very specific examples from my life as well. Like, I think really? everybody's worked with somebody who's difficult, right? It's like tough, especially when they're in a position of power over you. Yeah. What are you going to do? It's like you're you're trapped. So you can either be miserable 
or you can figure out a way to, you know, rationalize this behavior or, or I'm not saying forgive it, um, because it's never okay for somebody to be like unkind or hurtful to other people, but to understand it, you know, and, and I've done that in the past before too, like, like figured out, oh, this is how this person was raised up. This is why they have these behaviors. This is a, an immediate reaction. This is a coping mechanism they developed over time and doesn't have yeah. anything to do with me, has everything to do with them. And yeah. at those points, I could um, feel bad for that person. And then, you know, it, it, it sort of made it okay. Um, also, you did not just hostage negotiation, but you did undercover work as well. That's so right. That has to be kind of hairy. Uh, and like, well, I mean, really, this all seems like such a strange series of events, but I think that's mostly what life is, right? You just happen right. upon one moment where you make a choice and another moment, another moment. And I, I think that's uh, probably a lot of what factors into the to the work you've done over time. But tell me a little bit about, because um, you started as undercover agent, right? And then started doing the negotiation stuff. That's correct. So when I got in the FBI, every FBI agent has their investigative duties. But in addition to that, you can pick up a collateral duty and it can be in something that you have an interest or a background in. So if I was a scientist, maybe I'd become someone on the evidence response team, or maybe if I was super jacked and love guns, I would be on the SWAT team. <laughs> um, again, I think going with my psychology background, it it interests me, the undercover work. I truthfully though, didn't know that I could do it. I mean, I was a kid that grew up kind of nervous and shy. I kept close to my people. Um, I wasn't super adventurous. And so as I got older, I did it a little bit more, but I didn't have tons of years of being that personality. So it always gave me pause. Um, but what I learned, again, going back to the psychology part, is it's really just about people and just having a genuine interest and in ingratiating yourself to people. And I thought, well, I could do that, right? So I had some wonderfully supportive female FBI agents that were doing undercover work and they were like, you should totally do it. And I said, okay. So it just started off small and I really tripped into it. It's kind of a funny story, but um, I was on a surveillance watching a target, which was probably about eight or nine men sitting at a restaurant at a steakhouse in Manhattan. And the case agent that was working the investigation, she was saying, I want to put people around the table. Let's see if we can overhear any of this conversation, right? And so they were pairing people off as like a couple, male, female, out for dinner like a date. And a friend of mine, she said, well, let's do it different. Let's just put four women at a table. And so the four of us just sat at a table. And strangely enough, in the middle of their dinner, one of the targets got up and came over to our table and asked us to go meet them in a bar. And it was like, oh no. I think initially the case agent was like, "What's? why are the targets now approaching my surveillance team? I think wondering if we messed something up. Oof. But what ended up happening was they invite us to the bar. So we call the case agent and say to her, do you want us to go? And she's like, yeah, go see what happens. So we met her in the bathroom and we dumped off our guns and our badges to her. Um, into her purse. So she walked out of the bathroom with this giant bag full of, you know, five guns. And we went to the bar and I realized it's just, it became just men talking to women in a bar where if I had thought of it as some big undercover operation, trying to get all this intel, I may have approached it differently than just having a normal conversation that I had done t other times prior. And in that conversation, now, they didn't give us a ton of information that broke the case wide open, but they told us who all the players were. They jokingly, one guy referred him to himself as the embezzler, <laughs> which, what? Like, they had no idea who they were talking to. And that gave me a little bit of a taste of what it could be like and how just allowing people to talk and asking the right questions elicits so much information. And that was like my teaser and entry into undercover work. And so I then was able to go to the undercover school that the FBI puts on. It's like two weeks long. And then from there, um, once you're certified to do undercover work, I could just move on from there. And then I could pick the cases that I felt that I could sell the best, right? 
you're probably not putting me on a street corner to, you know, buy drugs, you know, but there are certain drug scenarios that you could put me in, right? And so it's just finding ones that I fit. And that's what's great about the FBI is we have all different kinds of people. Hmm. And so they are able to really pick people from different areas to make it match for the scenario they need. That's interesting. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm caught up on this juxtaposition of as, as a child, you were very, uh, it sounds like quiet, shy. And sure. now do you feel like, do you feel like having the badge is what gave you some of that courage? Or the reason I ask is also, this is a parallel you, you may not have drawn, but um, drag queens tend to say that whenever they're in drag, they feel like a completely different person. They feel invincible. They feel powerful, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, they're behind the makeup, they're behind the outfit. And so no. it gives them this power that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Do you feel like maybe the badge or just the fact that when you're undercover, you are, you're under this other set of makeup, right? Like, like yeah. what do you feel like gave you the most power to kind of do that? Yeah, that's a really good question because I know what you mean about the difference of having the badge. And I think that could be taken good ways and bad ways, right? Mm. There would be times where like any human, you can have self-doubt or some fear and it causes you to pause. Uh, I would sometimes say to myself like, okay, look, let's go. Like you're an FBI agent, let's go, right? Like I, I would have <laughs> to shift my mindset sometimes. Um, if I was overtly as an FBI agent, I always had a lot of people with me as a negotiator. I had an entire SWAT team behind me. I mean, those things do help you kind of uh, display some power and have some confidence. Undercover work's really different though, because sometimes you're either going in as one person, just yourself, or you're going in with like a small group and you're not saying you have this big power behind you, right? I may be saying I'm sort of a lowly person and that's why you should interact with me or I'm this different position. And so it really is just channeling who you are. And maybe because you can be someone different, they don't know your whole history. They don't know your whole background enough and you can make your background whatever you want it to be. Could allow you, I see in a similar comparison to drag queens that you could be a different person. You could act a different way. I think it's a little bit, like I said before, we all have so many sides of us, right? And so probably inside me, there's little parts of all of it. And you just have to kind of dig into that little part of you and bring that out for each role, depending on what it is. Hmm. You know, something I've, I, a common thread I've heard in here, you you mentioned how you were surrounded by supportive people, like your parents were supportive and then uh, supportive people when you got the application, supportive people inside of here that encourage you to do undercover work. Yeah. It sounds like you really surrounded yourself with people that are that are going to lift you up. Do you feel like it's tough for you to make like a big heavy decision without, you know, having people to kind of, yeah. you know, act as counsel sort of for you in these scenarios? Um, yeah, I am a person that uh, does like to lean on people, like to have a team with me. Um, I do think that helps me in making decisions as you kind of process it through with someone. I'm not afraid to make a decision on my yeah. own, but I do like having a team and I have been blessed to have a wonderful family. I have a wonderful family myself with my husband and my kids that we've created, but that is important to me. And even as an FBI negotiator, we would work as a team because it's no one person has every answer, can see all things, can process mm -hmm. all information. And that team to me, in my experience, just makes it better because it's those different perspectives, those different inputs that I hadn't considered. Because sometimes depending on the crisis or the situation or the problem, it's a lot to take in, right? And we yeah. all have our different processing speeds and other things that are going on. And so I, I do function better in a team. Yeah. And, it, and to your point, everybody's got different lived experience, right? So yes. maybe this scenario is something that's familiar to you, right? And less familiar uh, to me. And, and so, you you know, you have some specific insight that would kind of help in those. You know, it's, it's funny, early in life for me, um, talk about having a team or whatever. Like, I've always felt like a loner. Like, I always had to make these decisions. Yeah. Month. And then in my early professional life, I felt like I couldn't ask anybody questions. And uh -huh. now that I've gotten older and I've yeah. realize that people can help me and I can ask for help. My life has been so much enriched by that. I almost feel jealous. The fact that you, uh, you had that like 
together at such a young age that you actually had people that you trusted that you would ask yeah. for advice that you you felt that way it's to me that's almost a foreign concept can i ask like did you used to define yourself as someone that made decisions on their own was was that a source of pride or you just felt like you were didn't have an option uh i just mostly raised myself yeah yeah okay. so it was just self-reliance like not yeah. having an option or a choice and you know that that early stuff gets so baked in that you know it kind of it felt like that uh going you know for a really long time it, and honestly uh my partner my wife is is the one that that genuinely helped kind of uh, crack that exterior and then start opening those things up and then, you know, allowing me to, to ask other people for it's something, um, Brene Brown, I, I heard her say mm -hmm. one time is that, you know, like, um, if you're a good friend, right, you'll, you'll help somebody when they ask you for help. But part of being a good friend is also allowing that other person to help you when you need yeah. it. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, that's so hard. That's yeah. so hard for people to do. Like I'm Thanks. always the first to help anybody else, but it's like so hard for me sometimes to to ask for that help but well that's her big thing is vulnerability right yeah. and it being vulnerable enough to say i don't have all the answers i don't have it all figured out i'm mm. not managing that's really hard yeah i same i mean i like to be there for people i like to help them i can take a lot like i really can take on a lot and keep going but i have to learn that maybe i don't need to keep taking a lot that maybe sometimes i can say like can I have a day today where I'm not my best self and can you carry it? Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm happy for you that you have a partner that can help you do that. Mm. Does that make you feel selfish when you do that? You take a day, like a me day sort of thing? Oh, very. Yes. I think I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is weird. I've got to do something. Yeah. Yeah, like Ricky Bobby and uh, Talia Ignites. What do I do with my hands? Where, where <laughs> do I put them? Yeah, yeah, get it. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So we started out as undercover, and then at some point you transitioned to a uh, hostage negotiation. And I, I'm assuming that well, one, the, the psychology aspect kind of helped prepare you for that. And I'm assuming some of the undercover work, because you said it, it turned into me just having conversations with people, right? Yes. So I did do undercover work for several years. Um, there was a definitive like life change for me. My husband, I said, was also in the FBI, but he stepped out of the FBI and deployed with the Marines to Iraq for a year. Mm -hmm. And then when he came back, we were getting married like a short time after. And so it was like, okay, well, I was doing all this undercover work up until his return and sort of like living my best life, right? I'm out there in the world. And then he comes back and we're getting married. And I thought, I want to do nothing but like check back in with him get ourselves together and married, and then I'll go back to undercover work. Well, what ended up happening was, you know, we took our time to sort of reconnect to get married. And then not very long after getting married, I got pregnant. Uh. Not very long after having one kid, I had another kid. Mm. And it just separated me a little bit. And then, I don't know if you have children, but um, it, it changes your heart when you do it. And I think as a mom, it sort of weakened my heart a little bit is what I say, right? <laughs> it mattered more me being around and I didn't want to put myself in these positions. And so mm. I stopped doing as much undercover work as I did prior. Um, I still did small things the rest of my career, but nothing like I did in that earlier part. And, but I missed sort of the action and the crisis part of it. And so it it came up for me that I could be a hostage negotiator. And it was like a very logical transition then for me to go there because I could be overtly FBI. I can wear the vest with it written across, but I'm still sitting in an armored vehicle with an entire SWAT team behind me. So safer. I mean, I know that's relative to other jobs, but hmm. safer um, than me being an undercover and pretending to be someone I, you know, I didn't I didn't have the protection of the FBI being obvious and so it, it helped me still stay in the mix and uh and it gave me all the things that i got from undercover work but just in a different way so when you find yourself in those i, I was going to say stressful situations and i i don't know any other way to, to to define that you know whether you're undercover or say in a hostage negotiation scenario i would say that would to me that feels more stressful um do you feel like everything kind of slows down and you can 
focus? Are you one of those people where um, everything kind of, I just feel calm all of a sudden and I can, I can focus in this moment? Yes, that's so true. So you must do that in your life, right? To be, <laughs> that that's even a thing. But yes, I think for me, the bigger the crisis gets, the more kind of zen and focused I can get. Um, I don't know if I just had that in me or that's developed over time. Like, what would you say? I'm assuming, are you like that? I, I think it's an anomaly. I, I think uh, I think we are freaks of nature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> genuinely, you know, because yeah. I've, I've learned that there are some people that actually could con uh, concoct scenarios in which it will throw them into a stressful situation because they like to be in that place. It like, it like calms them down a little bit. Um, yeah. Mine was, mine was, I think, partially learned scenarios. Because uh, yeah. I remember at first, uh, so I'll give you 30 second version. So I was Please. network engineer for a long time um, in charge of some really big networks, like portions of the internet. And uh, when everything breaks, there's these charts that show you how much money, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars we're losing for every minute of downtime. Right? So it's just extremely stressful. Stressful. And, and so when you have new engineers come on, the first thing I would always say to them is, um, when everything breaks, you're going to fold like a lawn chair. That's okay, <laughs> right? I expect it. You know, it'll be fine at the end of it. And, you know, some of them would assure me, no, they're totally cool. Yeah. And they would crumble like a sandcastle. <laughs> you know, it just yeah. happens. Um, it does. But through repetition, right? You get those reps. Like, they would learn to at least hold it together. Um, but I think also for me, part of it was everybody was looking to me. So if I was freaking out, they were going to freak out. So I had to like be calm. And there's been scenarios in my life where I was in, um, we're going down the highway and this car sideswiped us a little bit going 70. And I just casually put the blinker on and I pulled over to the side of the road and I was checking everything the out. Blinker. And, and, yeah. And everybody was losing their mind in the car. Just like, it, just absolutely bonkers. And I was just, you know, this like a normal day. I was thinking, this isn't normal. Like I realized everybody's reaction around me. I was like, I'm the odd man out on this yeah. one. So do you find yourself doing that sort of thing still? Yes. I will admit, like little secret don't tell anyone, I, as I get older, it, not that it's a little harder, but it, I am finding I don't process stress probably as great as I used to. Um, I might just be at a weird time in my life, but yeah. Me too. The more yeah. I get away from it, the further distance I get. Yeah the less I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not as but, practiced. So it's interesting. This is why I tell my kids, right? And I think this is true for everyone. You have to practice doing hard things hmm. to know you can do hard things. You can't just like say, uh, I'm sure I'll be great at that. If, if you don't even try the first step that's 10 steps before the crisis, right? So, you know, we just... I think as parents, we always try to say, you know, like push. It's hard to know when to push and when to not because people have to make that individual decision. But I think it sounds like in your life and true for mine that trying things that made you all comfortable or having yourself in situations where it was like, okay, and you have to figure it out, it builds that muscle. Oh. Right. And you, but you have to do it. And nobody likes it. I didn't like it. I'm sure you don't like it. Right. It is scary. But you have to harness that feeling. And if you can get yourself into that bubble where it's quieter, even though everyone around you is screaming, um, and then just focus solely on the task that matters in that moment, that's when you're, I mean, I always say to my kids, like nothing's ever accomplished from a freak out, right? So if you need <laughs> to freak out, let's take five minutes and let's freak out and scream and do other things and then stop with the feelings and work, right? Like just get to action. But sometimes you need to do it to get it out. But you get that feeling of your mind spinning. And as if you can calm that and just focus, that's when you can really harness that Zen power. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, you know, if I, when I think about it, like those reactions, I think that's an uh, evolutionary development. You know, it, it, it kept us alive, obviously. You know, saber tooth yep. tiger appears, you know, we have to be able to, to react quickly. But, you know, it's like where they say, fight, flight. I think there's two more. One is like freeze and something else. And yes. if you freeze in that scenario, it's not like a T-Rex in Jurassic Park. The tiger is going to eat you, you know? Yeah. So you have to, or I say somebody has to, I guess it doesn't always have to be yeah. you specifically, but somebody in that area, in that vicinity has to 
you know, keep everybody alive. And so I love yeah. that you just said that because you're right. Like we all have moments where we've frozen. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I also don't want people to be afraid of it. Like it, it may happen and you need to just look around you who can help you. Or maybe in your life, you look around and you see someone freezing and you help. Right. And so if we do that for each other, then we can cover all the things. Right. <laughs> Moving yeah. forward. But yeah. But I think that only works to your point. When you have a team, when you trust people, you, trust. you surround yourself with people. You don't make yourself this island, right? Where you're, you're, you know, an army of one. Because if you freeze in that scenario, if you freak out, nobody's there to pick you up, you know. And yeah, and like you said, I mean, it's you're never an island. It's never just you. There's there's not one person. Even though people will tend to look to one person, like he or she seems really smart. She's got it. We'll follow them, right? they can't know all the things in all the situations. And so if you look at yourself by saying, I might be really good at this, but I don't know anything about that, right? Mm. So I'm gonna look to someone that does and together we can figure that out. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, yeah. I've always uh, envisioned life as kind of like this, I'm a, I'm a very visual person, very visual thinker, um, as like the staircase. And I think it's from like in the clouds, I think it's from like some biblical stuff I saw as a kid, you know, it's, yeah. stairways going to heaven or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your, your line of practicing, doing hard things, like I've always thought of it as like, sometimes there's gaps in that staircase, you know, and it's, it's, it's really hard to make that leap from one place to the other. And your, your, your line practicing hard things gets you ready for hard things that to me, practicing those hard things completes that portion of the staircase that you weren't able to ascend before. And you can, you can move on. Uh, and, that, and I guess some people are. And, and this is bizarre to me, they're content. Like some people reach a, a place in their life where they're content, you know, and there is that gap and they see it and it's too hard to, to get across and they don't want to put in the work. And I guess that's okay, but something in my brain never lets me be content. <laughs> you know, nothing's ever good enough. I, I, I always want to push and do more and see more. You never fully relax, right? There's probably positive and negatives to that trait. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and same for the content person, right? So you think we could learn sort of something from both ends? Because there is a period of contentment that's good, right? To just relax, sit back, enjoy it, process, take in all the great things that you have in your life or you've done in your life. But then to also not have that just shut you down forever. Then you're never learning or things like that. That's not good either. Yeah. Yeah. Something I've learned, uh, you know, this this podcast has helped me with this a lot is, um, but, you know, people say you have your comfort zone. Well, if you push out your com outside of your comfort zone and you stay there long enough, that becomes your comfort zone too, right? It gets yeah. bigger and bigger. And I started doing it so much that uh, I don't necessarily have a comfort zone anymore. Like it's huh. made me so willing to try new things and to be perfectly honest, to meet people like you, just amazingly insightful people. Like I, I have so many asterisks from you. It's what it's when somebody says something that's really uh, interesting to me, I, I put asterisks. So you were talking about I will, earlier. I will say, Greg, though, at different stages in our life, like I think once I left the FBI and trying to redevelop, what am I going to do now? Who am I going to be? It, it, it is an interesting time in my life right now where I feel like I've struggled with both. Yeah. I'm not constantly having to do all the things out of my comfort zone. So I love what you said about like it it just expands. And if you if you test it and make it bigger, then you can you said get to the point where maybe you don't even have a comfort zone. But the opposite is true, right? That if you don't, it does get a little scary. I've actually had those feelings in my life now where I have to go back to what we talked about before, where I have to say, Girl, you were an FBI agent and did some <laughs> stuff. Like get get it together. You know, like but it's good for me because I can go back to past experience where I was successful, that it does help me in those challenging moments. I always have to think about, like, what about people that haven't had that? How do you get them to that place to have it? Or like my children, right? It, it's it's like highlighting for people when they do do something so they can reference back to it when it gets hard again. That's fascinating. I never really thought about that. Like I, I could look to the past and say, you know what? I've I've already done this. I've already climbed a mountain. I could do yeah. another one, right? It's it's a different place. It looks a little different. It might be higher, but I've done that before. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people saying, 
Uh, and I'm curious, like, yeah, I don't know why this popped in my head, but they say representation matters. Like, you know, in, in media and in, in, you know, just like books or whatever it happens to be, they want to see people like them doing things that are amazing. Do you feel like that's something that's ever been important to you? Yes, I, I do. And I think, I love when people say that. And I think, yes, if you're a true leader, you should have this great imagination to just imagine just yourself in something no one's ever done before. True. That's a... I'm happy we have people in the world that are like that. Again, I think that's also people's backgrounds that get you to have that ability to think like that, right? Some people literally live in the survival element of life, and it's really hard to become this fully actualized person where you can imagine things like that. So I think um, that that it, for me is like more important to have people like you just learn it from each other, right? And that's where I try to tell people as an FBI agent, you know, I would knock on people's doors and they would be like, oh, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect it to be you. Like, you're not <laughs> what I thought an FBI agent looked like. Right. So I think one, that's good. But it also I don't want to play into, although maybe sometimes I would if it helps me in my work, but I don't want to play into the mystery of all this. I'm a human being. I would do undercover work, but I would be like nervous before. But I want to tell you, like, yes, I have all the feelings that you have, right? I would get nervous before, but then I would tell myself, okay, I practice and prepare as much as I can, and then I do, right? Just to show people you can have all the feelings. I'm not like some robot that just is like fearless of nothing. No, but I still do it. And I think that's important for people to talk about that part because I think sometimes people put on a mask to just look cool. Because that's what people want to see, right? I want to really? see, like, wow, you're amazing and nothing phases you. No, nope, that's not true. Yeah, for me, it's always been more important to see somebody do something amazing and then learn about them that they're an actual human. That, right. that has, like the fact that you've done all these things, but I keep hearing you say how you have to pep talk yourself. And I was just thinking like tying those two together, like representation, you know, like if you want to see somebody doing that thing, and there isn't representation, you could be the representation. It's yeah. Like, look back at what you've done. Like, I am. I am the representation. I've done awesome things. I can continue yeah. to do awesome things. That's so cool. Yeah. You do that for yourself. Yeah. I don't I don't know if it's pathological or helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds helpful. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. I, I like try not to like, you know yeah. what they say, is, is it really a crazy idea if it works? You know what I mean? So. And sometimes it might be a crazy idea and it doesn't work, but it may not have worked just because of one part or it's not the right situation for that. But like, let's keep it open because maybe it would work another time, right? Yeah. So share it, like throw it on the table. Let's talk about it. Mm. It's, um, what do they talk about that imposter syndrome? Yeah. Right. So I, what is fascinating to me about that is people that are new to something don't have imposter syndrome, but it's the higher level that you get you can fall into imposter syndrome because you realize all that it takes to get to that level. And then you think, oh my gosh, I didn't know that when I was starting out and maybe cocky and confident, understand more the complexity of things and think, wow, I got to hear how much more do I not know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, especially in the, uh, the industry I work in the, the IT stuff, there's a lot of that because a lot of people are say neurodivergent and just yes. you know, a lot of different personalities and it is it is huge in there so i uh i have suffered from that in the past but i am amazing now so i don't worry about it i'm like the <laughs> coolest thing ever yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but to kind of i don't know it kind of it kind of feels a little bit like imposter syndrome but the, the question i had is, is you sort of touched on it earlier is that now that you're retired you're trying to to find out who you are again and and i think i've heard of people refer to that as kind of ego death like this is entirely how I defined myself before and now I have to let go of that and then, and then be over here and it definitely it's something you've done in the past and I think it's an amazing tool to help you um, market yourself in the future or in your pep talks but how how tough was that I mean obviously you didn't feel it on day one of retirement but maybe on day 60 you know that started sinking in like what was that like yeah I think um it's true, right? That you have to like redefine yourself. I, I do think change is good. And I could have stayed in the FBI for longer. And I was, I knew it. I was successful at it, somewhat comfortable. But 
I think it was good for me to change up and do something else when I'm relatively young enough. Um, and, but it, it is important. I, and I have to say to myself, like, I just have to take what I know and present it. Right. I, I don't have the answer to everything, like in my trainings, right. I don't know everything. I can't fix every problem. Cause a lot of my trainings is in all different types of industry. What I've learned is that what I do know is that process that you and I talked about, Greg, of how to manage a lot of information coming in, how to kind mm. of center yourself. Because in every industry, there's a problem, there's a crisis, there's a something that needs to be solved. And how looking at the big picture, how asking questions to get more information, to like assess where we're going with it. And then you just plug in what the industry is, right? Because those people have that knowledge. And so, but it really is, if you can get that ability to like look at in the weeds, but really step outside and then look at the big picture of like, why are we doing this? Where are we going? That that works for anybody. Mm. It was good for me to learn that, that I could take my limited or my specific experience as an FBI agent. And it's just, it really is applicable in all areas. Yeah. So heavily trained. Did you ever, did you ever see yourself being a, a teacher or instructor or or whatever, whatever you define yourself as now? Yeah, um, not overly, but when I was an FBI agent, um, I ran our local, my field office's crisis negotiation team. And part of that was we trained law enforcement to be negotiators in their police departments. Hmm. So I was sort of put into it, like you have to do this. And <laughs> I just felt like I could take concepts and put them into the everyday that people could absorb them better. And I just think that made it a natural progression that I could just say, like, you do this all the time. And 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 why are we doing this? And I'm teaching you to do X, Y, Z, but here's the reasoning behind it. Right. Because I think that helps people absorb it better. Yeah, than for sure. Telling you do this. Yeah. Well, one, that's a superpower to be able to oh. take complex <laughs> concepts and topics and and make it consumable by any audience. Like yeah. one of the one of the things uh, I challenge like IT people in these really technical uh, areas is you can explain it to me now explain it to a kid in third grade right in such a way like if you do that and you can do that successfully you actually really know what you're talking about if you can't you know maybe you put a little bit more time into it like think yeah. about how you can convey that to another person I think that's I think you're right that that means you really understand it then yeah 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 and it's tough because. You know, there's this assumption of knowledge or uh, often referred to as the burden of knowledge. Like you assume everybody else knows everything you do, right? So you mm -hmm. have these gaps in what you explain things like, oh, you already know all these pieces. So I'll just high level here. And, and, and oftentimes when you're surrounded by really smart people, that may be the case. But then in your instance, you're talking to people that may be brand new to this and yeah. you've got to fill in all those gaps. And also to be aware that this other person I'm talking to may not know all this and let me flesh this out and let me do it in such a way that it doesn't hurt their ego. Yes. Or, <laughs> I, I'm sure <laughs> you going into, you know, police department, talking to all of these, uh, probably, I, I don't like to characterize, but I'm sure there's a couple of swaggering personalities in there and, and you yeah, have think? to, yeah, uh, <laughs> this is, you know, just complete outside. <laughs> maybe I've, no, yeah. I, I've got a lot of family members that are cops. So yeah, I, I'm familiar with those knuckleheads sometimes. Not all of them. Some of them are very <laughs> understanding, but some of them also, you know, they, they have a little bit of a chip on their shoulders. So the idea that you can walk into any room and do that, that is a freaking superpower. That's crazy. But I think what you said is so important, and you're right, it's it's the assumption, right? I assume, we in all our conversations, we assume a lot of things. Hmm. I have trained myself as a negotiator to be a, try to be aware of what my assumptions are really? and check them. And so it has helped me learn to not make as many. Cause I think sometimes people make them unconsciously and like, you're right. Like I've been in, I mean, working for a government agency, right? I could be sitting in a briefing and someone's using every acronym. And it's like that acronym may be specific to the government, but it's also specific to your avenue. And mm. I'm over here and I don't know what that is. So you have to talk where everyone can understand. I remember being in a SWAT briefing one time and the SWAT team leader is using every acronym in the world. And I turned to even one of the SWAT members and I said, 
Do, what what does that mean? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> and I go, the funny thing about that is you're in charge of this acronym and you don't even know what the acronym is. Yeah. And so like you realize that people do this in small teams and big teams. And so like, just take that away. I think people are more concerned of like sounding cool or it makes me sound smart. And when you're in that place that you're talking to how you hear yourself, right? Like if you're talking to say, how do I look doing this? You've missed it, right? You need to be asking yourself, like, how is this landing? And is this effective, right? And I, I just feel like I see so many people doing it from the other side. And so it, it always helped me, like, in my empathy of trying to connect with the other person, um, that comes from it. But then the assumption part comes from it. It's really challenging that, like, wait, I just made a statement. Why do I believe that? Like, where does that come from? This, like, <laughs> assumption that it has to be done this way or the only way for the target to come, the barricaded subject to come out of the house has to be here. Does it? Maybe it does. But can we talk about that? Because could it be somewhere else that could it could help us in a different way? And being strategic in those choices. That's so fantastic. Like, <laughs> check your assumptions and then just think, why do... Why do I, how do I know this? Like, why yeah. is this the truth? You know, and, and I know we're coming up close to time, but um, mm. something that impressed me so greatly one time was I was in a, a meeting with a CFO at a company I was working at and he, uh, you know, we were talking about something and he said, I, I don't, I don't understand that. And it was something that was technical, but it was kind of simple for all the technical people in the room. And he was so unafraid to yeah. say, I don't know. To yeah. be the person in the room to say, I don't know. I was like, holy crap. The C, you know, the CFO says that. I was like, oh, that's, that's wild. Like, it just, it seems so insane to me. And what what a message that sends everyone else. <laughs> it's okay to ask. And be the person that's strong enough to ask, but also be the person that if someone's asking you, that your response is not shame, shutting them down, and be like, thank you for saying that. I, I just, here we go. And then we can back it up. Right? You want to be encouraging so people can ask that because that miscommunication every time is where it falls apart in everything. Mm. In a crisis for me in the FBI, in the IT world, in everything. It's that somebody didn't say something or it, did, it got miscommunicated and that's where the problem came. Yeah, yeah, because you, know, you have uh, an understanding of what something is in your head. You say it out loud with your words. That doesn't mean when they... You know, it enters their ears. It means the same thing to them. And, right, right. You know, it, I've definitely had misunderstandings with people, and it's like that is entirely not my intention. And you don't get to pick how they interpret the information. You just do your best, right, and try and yes, read those cues and stuff, and be open to know that maybe it didn't land, and to be able to talk it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something else that uh, after the C the CFO did that. Eventually, in my career, I learned. If I'm in a room and I know people don't understand what this person's saying, another brave thing is to ask a question as if I don't know it, even though I already know it, you know, yeah. to, to, to lower yourself. Like uh, a lot of humility is what I, I had to, to learn over time, right? And, uh, you know, if you if you can be brave for other people in that scenario, it's it goes a long way for yourself as well. Yes. Humility is a wonderful life skill. We need more of it in the world. So, yes. It's tough. It's tough. You, know, it. you don't you you um you don't want people to think of you uh as as a lesser or whatever but if they're yeah. not there to understand that you know that's actually the braver part then they'll get there one day and that's okay what's well, so thought like you said it says more about them than it does about you right yes ma'am so if you can know that then you don't have to be afraid of being lesser right you're just being yourself and understand you don't have to know everything every minute of every day so it's tough. It's tough for a lot of people. It not much, honestly, not me anymore. I don't, I, I've learned that I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room because that means I don't have anything to learn. And, yeah, I don't want to think uh, of. I can, I can always uh, be like yourself. I can always surround myself with, with smart people like you who can nope. teach me so many amazing things. And having said that, yes. I know we're coming close to our time and I would be very respectful of your time. I know you're uh, quite a busy person. So. Oh. Thank you. Uh, right here at the end, I like to ask, is there any way you want people to, to interact with you online, maybe your website, or uh, you have an event coming up, anything like that, anything you'd like to promote? What, uh, what does that you. look like? Yeah. If people want to reach out to me, the easiest, best way to do it is through LinkedIn. 
So I'm on LinkedIn, Melissa Fortunato. Um, I work with several different companies. I do all kinds of different things. So that's probably the best place where you'd see all of that. I would love to connect with people. Feel free to reach out, send messages. Um, it's always interesting to hear what other people are doing and like our awesome conversation today, right? You just learn things from the way people say things. It helps you, you even process something that maybe you knew a little bit, but it lets you look at it differently. So I love that. I am happy to connect with anyone. Yeah, I'm so pleased you uh, you took the time. That, that's something I've learned is even if you think it's a piece of information that's been said 10 times before, the way you say it, you know, the lived experience that you bring to that exactly. is going to resonate with somebody. It's really going to click. And, and uh, I'm so glad that you took the time. You were so open and honest and so giving of your time. I appreciate you so much, Melissa. Thank you. I appreciate you. I love this conversation, Greg. Thank you. This was really yeah. fun. Yeah. Let me hit stop on all this stuff real quick. <laughs>